morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Amen? Amen. 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 This morning, I want us to prepare our hearts and our minds as we continue to go through our, our uh, series, the five practices of fruitful living. And I want us to continue to think about what we heard last week and build upon it. Last week, we were listening uh, to Radical Hospitality, and this week, I want us to focus on passionate worship. So as we prepare and continue to go through our worship service this day, and from this point, point on, let us continue to keep in mind what passionate worship truly means. I want us to also consider that we are growing in a way that we've never before. We're going in a way that we've never before. And I don't know if it's lost on anyone, but we're moving closer in our relationship with each other and with God, more so than ever. I've seen it in our interactions with each other. I've seen it in multiple ways in which after service we leave, and it doesn't matter who's at the door next, you're talking to each other, there's no clicks, there's no um, hiding of secrets or statements of anybody, but just Whoever's there, we are all having a conversation with each other because we're in true relationship with each other. And I believe God is well pleased. Amen? Amen. 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 Now I will ask for us to have our last of the best message. <laughs>
I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. So, I don't know there. Um, now, think about that. No movie hero ever said it better, did they? The difference is Jesus wasn't speaking off a script that someone else wrote to convey that he was a macho man. He spoke in the framework of the three C's, courage, compassion, and commitment. Nothing was going to come between him and his goal, which was doing his father's business. Now, as we face the coming week, whether we're the windshield or the bug, let's purpose to be intentional about doing our father's business. Let's work hard not to be distracted by stress or even worse, fear. Friends, we are supposed to be like Jesus. That means we need to love the unlovable, we need to give up ourselves sacrificially, and we need to have compassion for those who are hurting. Most of the time, we depend on our natural response. Again, respond, doing things that come to us naturally. But maybe this week, let's try to be more proactive. Let's turn to the ultimate role model of Jesus, and focus, yes, really focus on what our Heavenly Father would have us to do in His name. As 2 Timothy 1.7 reminds us, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He has given us those gifts, but it's up to us to use them. And now, let's turn to announcements. Don't forget that the church is still receiving donations for the bunny breakfast and Easter egg hunt. The collection plate is at the back on the little uh, table at the back uh, for that purpose. And volunteers are also needed for the April 1 event. No fooling. Um, Barbara needs help um, with uh, organizing the kit, you know, with organizing the kids to go outside and helping to hide the eggs. And I understand Greg, I mean, we're doing the cooking, or, uh, and Greg needs help in the kitchen, as I understand. I'm, I'm going to volunteer to be a server. If, it, if there is anything in particular, Greg, that you need, anything in particular? Right now we've got, you know, several people that have come forward and, and volunteered, so right now we're in good shape. Okay, so. good deal. So, um, anyway, let's pray for that event, that it's a wonderful uh, time and that we have we need children come out. And the vision team, if you're on it, will be meeting on, on Tuesday, March 7th at 6 p.m. here at the church. And finally, did you know that two very special people in our church are celebrating birthdays today? Gary Albertson. Yay. Yay. Yeah, and...
Ruby consciously and joys joyfully. Prepare to meet the opportunities you set before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
may receive an insight or feel a sense of peace or joy at completing this journey towards the center. This is the time to receive whatever God has for you. Receive the blessing that God has in store for you. Receive the insight that allows you to move forward when you were stuck, when you were concerned, when you were worried about something. Allow God to take that item, that issue, as you're in the center of the labyrinth. you are still in the center of the pattern, begin moving away from the center back towards the entrance. Reflect on your experience. Reflect on what you've shared with God. Reflect on the preparation to go back into this service. Reflect on a greater awareness of God's presence with you. continue our journey with you. We continue day by day, moment by moment, in the labyrinth of life. Sometimes we see it more as a maze when there are false entrances and exits. But help us to see the labyrinth as a journey with you and towards you. We ask you, God, this morning to quiet our hearts. Help us to remember to be still and know that you are God. Help us to remember in our moments with you that you are our rock, our refuge, our salvation, our strength, and so many other blessings and gifts that you have for us. Gifts that we did not earn, but gifts you give graciously and mercifully because you love us so. Gifts because you are our God and we are your children. Gifts just because, because you love us so much that you share your very best with us. Life, love, joy, peace, hope, faith, and so many other things. These are all gifts sent from heaven to us. Gracious Lord, you have seen what has gone on in this past week. You have seen... As we have seen the news, you have seen shootings, you have seen other tri tri trials and tragedies around us. But you know more than that, Lord. You know that there are also joys, there are also things to celebrate. Most of all, that you love us. You love us so much. You love us in spite of our sins. You love us because you created us. And nothing you created is out of your will. Nothing that you created is outside of the promise of everlasting life. If only we believe. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your son because he continues to show us the way. He is the way. He is the truth. 
thank you this morning for his truth, his way, and his life because through these examples we can see eternity. Because of his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, we are able to see everlasting life. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for his gifts of love and grace and mercy during his time on this earthly plane. We thank you for his lessons that he shared with his disciples. Because through those lessons, we continue to grow as disciples in this generation as they grew in their generation. We share the, the prayer that they shared during their time on earth all together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let's stand, congregation, and sing hymn number 351, Pass Be Not, O Gentle Savior. And let's sing this with our full heart and full spirit. If you really don't want the Lord to pass you as you are praying, we have to live righteously so that our prayers will get past the ceiling. Let's sing, let's sing all of the stanzas. I get it in my hand. Okay, you have four stanzas. Let's sing uh, the first, second, and last. Let's do that. The first, second, and last. Pass me out.
to come forward. Let us continue to keep in prayer those in our community because we know even as spring is starting to come forward, there are still people in such dire need as the basic necessities of life. Let us come forward at this, at this time and keep them in prayer. He's got the whole world in his hands. Sing it with us. He's got the whole world.
joy family to recuperate, to rejuvenate, to refresh, and then to return to us that they may continue to serve in this house of prayer. We ask you for safe travel mercies, and we thank you for the gift of their love for this church family and for their family in the Philippines. We thank you for them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. It is entitled, Isaiah's Commission. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Mm -hmm. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I sing? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Mm -hmm. This is the word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Almighty God, we're continuing to listen to you to learn what practices we can embark upon or continue to grow in that make us fruitful, that grow us in our fruitfulness. This morning, we want to learn more about passionate worship. We want to learn what it means to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. We want to know what it means to worship and praise you without ceasing. For Lord, we know though we may leave this space, this sacred place, we still can worship you in our hearts always and everywhere. We thank you for the gift of worship. Because through that gift, it allows us to know that we are in a relationship with you and with each other. And we are growing in that relationship with you and Christ. Now, Lord, show us passionate worship. Show us how we can be more and more passionate each and every time we praise your holy name. Show us how to be grateful in our worship to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 As we prepare to dive into our second week in a series, the five practices of fruitful living, based on the five practices of fruitful congregations, as we grow in our living personally, our congregation, our congregation grows in its fruitfulness as a collective. Mm -hmm. Last week, we talked about radical hospitality. We talked about what it meant to be radical in our hospitality to others. We learned a little bit about the difference between a visitor and a guest. We learned that guests are people we host versus visitors who just happen to show up. We pledge, we commit to be a host to our guests. This week, we will endeavor to learn about passionate worship. And passionate worship is worship that is grateful to God for the gift of worship. Mm -hmm. 
So passionate worship is grateful worship. A number of years ago, for those of you who may remember these guys, the Smothers Brothers, who remembers them? They did a routine on TV, and it went something like this. Dick, he asked, what's wrong, Tommy? You seem despondent. And Tom replied, I am. I'm worried about the state of American society. Dick said, well, what bothers you about it? Are you worried about poverty and hunger? Oh, no, that really doesn't bother me. I see. Well, are you concerned about the possibility of war? No, that's not a worry my either. Are you upset over the use of illegal drugs by the youth of America? No, that's not what's really bothering me. Looking puzzled, Dick said, Well, Tom, if you're not bothered by poverty and hunger and war and drugs, what are you worried about? And Tommy replied, I'm worried about apathy. I'm worried about apathy. This is a lack of interest or enthusiasm. Apathy is a problem in our churches. Yeah. There are worship services that are not interesting at all. And, and we wonder why people do not come more than once. We 21st century mainline Christians may not be known for passionate worship. But it has not always been this way. John Wesley, for example, was a passionate preacher of the 1700s who led worship services characterized by passion. Now, he may have started in the churches, but he eventually started preaching out in the fields in the countryside. This does not mean that the people would jump on the pews and roll in the aisles, though Wesley notes in his journal that periodic rocking took place during some of the gathering. Maybe that was the beginning of rock and roll. But rather, the passionate worship of Wesley's time was founded on the belief that God was indeed doing something significant in their midst. And thus, there was an anticipation, an expectation, a readiness to hear a word from God, to be prepared for the Spirit to move in unexpected ways. Last Sunday, we heard the song, Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Well, this is what they were expecting and anticipating every day. So they sang their hymns with great joy and, and prayed earnestly. And even though, in some instances, if you think about Charles Wesley, who wrote several thousand hymns, and you listen to the tunes, a lot of those tunes came from Irish clubs. The same songs we heard on Sunday morning had the same tune but different words. And they were sung just as fervently as the tunes in the bars. So they sang and they prayed and they were joyous in their expectation of worship. Wesley and other evangelical preachers of his day passionately proclaimed the gospel so that there was no doubt they believed what they were saying. It was indeed the case that most Christians of the early Protestant movement were passionate worshipers. But something happened along the way. The question before us is this. How do we recover the passionate worship of our mothers and fathers of the faith? Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> what God has done for us in Jesus Christ should lead us to live a faithful and moral life before Christ. All of which leads us to worship. In gratitude for the work of God in our lives, we live lives pleasing to God. God's grace and our gracious response come together in corporate worship. A necessary ingredient in passionate worship is genuine gratitude. Christian worship loses its passion when people gather not in gratitude to God. Worship is not about us, it's about God. We are not the ones to be entertained. God is. We are the entertainers. We are the worshipers. We are the ones to be singing praises to God. God sitting on his throne looking at us in expectation of a worship 
worthy of him. We are his entertainment. It's not about us. In worship, we read scripture to remind us that the main actor in the biblical drama is God. The same is true of our worship. Without gratitude, we will not gather for worship to give glory to God. We will look to receive even more, just as the ungrateful child on Christmas morning who, after opening up the many presents, wonders why there aren't more presents under the tree. Where is that one gift I wanted? I see 10, but where's the 11? We find that as we worship with glad and generous hearts, giving thanks for God's amazing grace, God who cannot help but being generous towards God's children will indeed give us in worship the word of help we need. But what we receive is the icing on the cake. It is not the fiber of worship of worship itself. God-centered worshipers do not go to church only wondering what they will get for their time on Sunday morning. Instead, they will get for their, uh, they will enter the sanctuary anticipating the same kind of experience the prophet Isaiah had when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah saw angels worshiping God, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with your glory. This is passionate worship where staleness does not enter, but a passionate and exciting worship is going on. Christian worship, whether it is traditional or contemporary, should be marked by joy and gratitude. When worship is not joyful, when it does not reflect our deep gratitude toward God, then it becomes primarily about us. What makes worship boring is not the style of the music or the flow of the service. Worship is boring when it is no longer about the God who makes all things new, who transforms all lives. Amen. If we look at that book I've been mentioning, you know, the one by that bishop I told you about last week, Bishop Stacy. Five Practices of Fruitful Congregations. Not to make light of it, but just to mention, that's just a subset of all that we should learn about fruitful living and fruitful congregations. We look at Bishop Stacy's writings and it says, God in Christ changes people's lives through passionate worship. Worship stirs people's souls. It inspires them, and it strengthens them. They find such help and encouragement and belonging and care that they cannot help but talk about every week and every day of their week, through the sermons, through the ideas, through stories, through the music and the prayers during that time of the service and throughout their week. The good news of Jesus makes all of the difference in the world. And we believers need to offer ourselves wholly and completely to God on Sunday morning and throughout the rest of our weeks. Whether we sing hymns or praise choruses, whether we lift our songs with organ or guitar, we need to worship in deep gratitude toward God in such a way that no one will ever leave the sanctuary, old timer or a newcomer, wondering, so what? So what? Such grateful worship is indeed passionate. But as much as we see that we are worshiping God and honoring God in our worship, there are benefits of our passionate worship to us. One is that worship puts our focus in the right place. Worship puts our focus in the right place. Often, when we are going through trials, the trials somehow get bigger in our minds than who God is. In other words, our problems are bigger than God, and that is nowhere near the case, nor will it ever be. And the longer we dwell on the circumstances, the more they seem to grow. As I heard recently, and I started to use this as my mantra, we're rehearsing for tragedy. We should. 
That whatever's going to happen, happen. But know that God is bigger than each and every problem that we go through. But when we focus on our, our thoughts on who God is, we see our circumstances start to shrink. We look at the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It says this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim mm -hmm. in the light of his glory and grace. When we think of our turning our eyes to Christ, everything else that is going on around us pales in comparison. When we think of that last issue that we ran into during our week, and then we think about what Christ is bringing us through and what he has brought us through, that seems to fade from our memory. But we have to turn our eyes to Jesus. We also have a benefit of worship satisfying our souls. When our bodies are hungry, we get food for nourishment. Worry wears down our souls. We become weary and we lose heart. The remedy or nourishment for this is worship. We were made to worship. We were created from the very beginning to worship and magnify God, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And when we worship, we can feel the cool water quench our thirst and the bread of life feed our souls. Amen. It's a thirst that nothing else can satisfy. That's right. David knew this and often would go to the sanctuary to seek God and just sit in his presence. And after spending time alone with the Lord, David's soul was satisfied in his mouth. Praise God with joyful lips. Not with sad, contrite thoughts, but with a joy and a passion that he could only muster by having a God in his heart. A God that he emulated because it was said he was a man after God's own heart. So surely his worship was passionate. Another benefit is that worship brings us closer to God. As Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he poured his broken heart out to God who was listening intently to his son. We don't have to see God to love him. We can see him with our spiritual eyes. Though we do not see him, we love him. And even though we don't see him now, we believe and are filled with an inexpressible, glorious joy because we know on that day we will. Mm -hmm. And knowing our faith in God pleases him makes the trials less burdensome. For the Bible says to us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Yes. It brings us closer to God. Our worship does this. Our passionate worship. Our grateful worship. Another benefit is that worship means we're letting go of why. We're letting go of why. Often as humans, we like feeling like we're in control, like we have all of the power. But when we go through trials and we choose to worship God, we are making a conscious decision to trust God, even though we don't understand what he's going to do. In other words, we're not asking why. We're not even asking how or when. God tells us his ways and thoughts are higher than ours, and I know that's true because even through struggling times, we can see the evidence of God being in our lives. Amen. The truth is, I don't want to control things in my life, but I have to remember to let go and let God. Yeah. And in that letting go, I am letting go of my will for God's will and worshiping God with God. My will being God's will. Mm -hmm. When we choose to worship, we are acknowledging that we are not in control. It is a conscious decision to submit to God. The first time I truly submitted to God, I almost heard something break, and I, I think it was my will. Mm. It was my will to do things my own way. It was my will to think that I knew best for my life. Yes, sir. But instead, as my will broke, and as we can say now, not my will, but
but yours be done, God. Mm -hmm. That will broke. And it's still breaking. Because on occasion, I still may run to that thought process that I know best. And though I'm a father, no, I don't know best. <laughs> but God, our Father, does know best. And that is a good kind of breaking. It wasn't me waving the white flag in desperation saying to God, I give up. But instead, it was me realizing God is God. And I am not. He is the plotter, and I am the clay. He is the creator, and I am the created. I am his watch. Mm -hmm. He is my watchmaker. Mm -hmm. Another benefit is that worship is our best warfare against the enemy. The enemy, Satan, whatever you want to call him, the adversary, he lie, his lies are like this. He'll say something to the effect, God doesn't care about you. We studied this in Sunday school this morning. The three things that he told Jesus, even in his temptations of him, were about entitlement, about power, and about identity. He says, God doesn't care about you. He says, if God loves you, why are you going through all of this? If you believe in God, why so? Because you are a fool if you trust the Lord. And the best weapon we have against the enemy of our souls is to worship. Because as we worship, our hearts and our minds are on God. And the better able to fight off the enemy's tricks by thinking about God. When we're worshiping God, when we're thinking about God, when we're praying to God, we don't have time to think about anything else. We don't have any room for anyone else in our minds and our spirits because God is filling that throne of our hearts. When we let other things creep in to our lives, that's when God is not able to sit on the throne. No two things or entities can be in the same place at the same time. That's science. That means that God cannot be on the throne of our hearts at the same time we or the enemy are. So we have a choice to make. Either we're going to be on our own throne of our hearts, or God is. That's our choice. That's why worship is our best warfare. It's our best weapon against the enemy. Last but certainly not least, as a benefit of worship, worship can lead others to God. We should not be in any church in this world saying us for and no more. That means we should not be saying, well, I've got mine. I don't care if anybody else gets theirs. I'm going to heaven, but I don't care if anybody else goes to heaven. I don't care if they benefit in this life by worshiping God and saying that because God is in my life, I am a better person and I'm doing things for other people. No, we have to make sure that what we're doing in worship is allowing us to go forward outside of these four walls and sharing it with others so that they are led to Christ. We discussed this in Sunday school as well. We don't necessarily make disciples, but we set the place and the atmosphere for God to make disciples. God is the one who makes and creates. But we can lead others to Christ by our life, by our walk, by our worship. And that is why grateful worship is passionate worship. When our hearts are turned to God and we worship Him even through seasons that could have been could have us asking, why me, God? Why this? Why now? Then others notice something different about us. They wonder how we can praise God while we're struggling. And when others see that our lives are often difficult, yet we choose to worship. They want to know about the hope that lies within us. When they see us smiling and they know what we're going through, they're wondering, what does this person have that I don't have? Who does this person have that I don't have? And when they ask you that question, the answer is, I have God in my spirit. And I'm worshiping him passionately in spirit and in truth. And I ask you to come and join me in worshiping him passionately, gratefully. Mm -hmm. When we see that others' lives are difficult and we choose to worship, 
then they want to know that hope is theirs too. Then we can get the privilege of sharing that hope with them. This is how passionate worship goes, where we are grateful and we know that the benefits of our worship is everlasting life. Worship without ceasing. We've heard the scripture say praying without ceasing. Worship is also under that banner. Because when we worship God, it doesn't mean that we're in church 24-7, but it means, it means our attitude is always in a grateful mood, and we're worshiping God with our hearts. Wherever we are, however we are, whenever we are, our worship is grateful when it's passionate. I want us to consider inviting those that we know need to experience passionate worship, need to see radical hospitality, need to know that there are people within this world that care about them, though they may never have met them before. Change their minds. Mm -hmm. Let them know there is someone that cares about you. I'll close on this note. There's a friend of mine back in Louisiana. His name is Joe Kelly. And he's infamous for one question. And he is the president of the United Methodist Men for the Louisiana Conference. And ever since I've ever met him, and for those who are even older than me, including my father who met him a long time ago, he remembers this one question. Has anyone ever told you that Jesus loves you? That's what he says to everybody he talks to. That's sometimes the only thing he ever says to people. So I ask you to share that with someone this day or this week. Has anyone ever told you Jesus loves you? The reason why I bring him up is because he has had an injury and he's in the hospital. And on Facebook and on email, everybody that typed something in included, Joe, we want to ask you, has anyone told you that Jesus loves you? That is something to be known for. And just as Joe is known for that statement, let us be known for that statement and for passionate worship and for radical hospitality and for being grateful to God for all the gifts that he shared with us all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for our ritual, for our dining at the Lord's table. And as we turn to number 13, let us remember that we can share radical hospitality with others and we can share passionate worship with others. Everywhere we go, every place we meet, we can share passionate worship. Because it doesn't just mean in the church, but it means
Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of me, your body acts in Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as we offer as, as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. For I want your hope, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and all these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I now ask our servers to come forward.
Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And amen. What a wonderful, wonderful worship experience. Let's stand, please, my loved ones. And we're going to say, we're marching to Zion. Come with me. Let's march to Zion. Let's sing uh, the first stanza and the last stanza, and then repeat the chorus. Yes. Yeah. 